Good morning everybody, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're watching from. Welcome to Fresh Goods Friday Down Under, or Fresh Goods Friday Thursday evening. Uh, and uh, I'm in the shed today, I've got a bike with me here that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, I've been riding this for the past, uh, well I rode it yesterday and I rode it a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's not actually a test bike. Um, but a lot of you guys have been asking about this bike based on some of the other test bikes I've been riding lately. So what I thought I'd do is uh, we go through this bike on, on live video. So if you've got any questions for me about this bike, um, if you've got any questions for me about any of the other test bikes I've been riding lately, kind of how they compare, um, or if there's a similar bike you're looking at at the moment that kind of fits into this mid-travel trail bike category, then drop them into the comment section below. And, uh, and I have the technology to be able to read out those questions and hopefully answer, answer them for you on, uh, on live TV. Because we're here on YouTube Live. Um, this is Single Track Magazine, my name's Will. So we've got people tuning in there. Hello, welcome, welcome to the show. Um, I can see we've got some more people tuning in. So thanks for joining. If you've got any questions for me, if you've got any feedback on this video, drop them into the comment section below. Oh, we've got uh, Timothy's in the house. Hey, Will. Hey, Timothy, thanks for joining in. Uh, uh, welcome back as well. Thanks for. Uh, I wasn't here last Friday. Um, I was away, but um, but have been doing these live videos. Hopefully, every every week on Friday morning here in Australia, uh, which is usually Thursday evening, depending on uh, whereabouts you're watching from. Shed Life Guy. Hi, Will. Nice to have you back after your secret trip. Thank you very much, Shed Life Guy. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. Good to see you back again. Um, so the bike we've got here, I should. Uh, we should get rolling on this one. It's the Trek Fuel EX. So you can probably tell by the uh, the clue in the name for this video. Oh, we've got Matthew in the house. Hello, hello Matthew, welcome, and uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, we're talking about the Trek Fuel EX demo bike that I've got here. Now, as I said earlier, this isn't actually a test bike. Uh, Trek hasn't sent me this bike for testing. Um, this is actually a demo bike from a local Trek dealer here in Bendigo. And the reason I've got this bike here is I wanted to ride it a few times. Um, I have ridden this bike in the past. I actually reviewed one a couple of years ago for single track. But I wanted to ride this bike to kind of re-jog my memory on the Fuel League X platform because this type of bike is very, very similar to the trail bikes I've been riding lately. So we're talking the Canyon Neuron CF, 130mm travel 29er. Giant Trance 29, which is also 29er, obviously, with a 130 fork and 115mm rear travel. Uh, we've got the Merida 120 on test at the moment, so that is a 120mm travel trail bike with 29 inch wheels and a 130mm fork. Ooh, um, L Stack is in the house, smash like. I don't know what that means, but that sounds cool. <laughs> Feel free to elaborate on that comment, smash like. Uh, you might be talking about this bike because yes, it can smash a lot of things. That's um, that's a good point. Hello, everybody. Says L Stacker. Hello, welcome to the show, L Stacker. Thanks for tuning in. We've got Missing Link MTB in the house. Love that black on black stealth color. That is a very interesting comment because Trek do this kind of black finish in quite a few different models, um, but they also do with the EX8 and with some of their other bikes. They do two options. So you can kind of get the full stealth black option, or I think this one comes in like a cherry red color, which looks pretty dope. Um, but they're kind of doing the, the mild but wild option. So if you kind of prefer the black stealth look, they do that. And that's this EX8 here, but they do another color option too. We've got some more questions coming through. Timothy, I love your show. I want to see how many I can see in a row. Right now I've watched four in a row. Yes, you have tuned in four in a row. Thank you very much, Timothy. Well, we've got plenty more coming your way. So make sure you tune in every Thursday evening or Friday morning uh, for the live show. And we've got Matthew saying, I think he means press the like button. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a good little... Uh, uh, a good little segue. So if you are enjoying this video, give me a thumbs up. I'd love to, uh, to have your feedback on this. Um, so yeah, as I was saying about the Fuel EX, um, it's not actually a test bike, but I was really keen to um, get a ride on one of these. And the guys at the bike shop very kindly lent me this demo bike to ride um, and, and indeed get a bit of feedback and a bit of a comparative feel to those other test bikes that I've got on the, on the go at the moment, the Giant Trance and the Merida 120. I've also just had another 29er trail bike turn up in a box at the shop, which I will have for you next week. So next Friday's live show is going to be on that bike. I'm not going to tell you what it is now, 
Um, so you'll have to stay tuned to next week's show. Uh, but we'll have another brand new 29er trail bike. So I'm doing quite a bit of a wrap up of all these trail bikes at the moment. So plenty to go. Uh, trail Talk MTB is in the house. Hey, Trail Talk MTB, thanks for joining. He's saying Radon, question mark. Radon, Radon. Uh, if anyone can help me with the pronunciation, Radon or Radon, um, question mark. So he's asking if that's a test bike. Uh, you'll just have to tune in next week to find out. Uh, Timothy, yeah, I love the colour. One of my riding buddies got a Slash 9.9 .9 and it looks so nice with the carbon finish and the white logos. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty hot bike, that Slash. Very, very good looking machine. Um, Greg is in the house. I got an 18 EX829. 18, do you mean size or you mean 2018? Um, I think you mean 2018. This is a 2019, by the way. Um, L Stacker, thanks for the live chat. My pleasure, mate, and thanks for tuning in and, uh, and commenting on the video and asking us questions as we go. Matthew says, Radon. Okay, all right, so we've got one vote for Radon. Uh, anyone else think Radon? Um, love to hear what you think on the pronunciation there. Um, right, Nick Bates, what are the biggest differences between the EX and the Neuron? Very good question. And uh, we're gonna go into some detail about this bike. What makes it different? What are kind of the unique technologies on this bike, how it rides on the trail, and then kind of how it compares to those other trail bikes that I've been testing and reviewing lately. So we'll go through the basic specs on this bike first. huh? This is a 130mm travel 29er, so we've got a 130mm travel fork, 130mm travel on the rear, 29 inch wheels, big bag tires. We've got Bontrager XR4 team issue tires here. These measure at no fewer than 2.4 earth inches uh, in terms of width. So they're a big high volume tire, pretty aggressive tread pattern. I think it's pretty cool that Trex put on some you know, proper tires onto their trail bike. Rather than putting on something lightweight and faster rolling, um, they've put on something that's got a bit more meat to it, a bit more aggressive kind of tread pattern. Um, not the lightest tires, but you know, they're gonna help you when it's rough and technical and you want traction in those kind of really rough, um, awkward sections of trail. Ooh, uh, Greg is saying, I just put 2.6 XR4s on today. That is very good to know because um, Greg bring, brings up a really good point there. So he's talking about, he's got a 2018 version of this bike and he's put on 2.6 inch wide tires, um, modders. Maybe just the, the camera angle, but that thing looks slack. Yeah, it's because the, kind of, the fork's kind of kicked out a little bit. So I think it is relatively slack. I'm going to talk about that shortly, uh, but it might just be a bit of the camera angle as well. So back to the tires, Trek states a maximum width on this bike, 2.4 inches wide. So they say 2.4 inches on the rear is the biggest you can fit. However, Greg has just pointed out, you can fit in a 2.6 inch wide tire. So there is clearance in the back end here. However, Trek states the official maximum clearance is 2.4 inch. Greg says 2.6 is clear. They measure 2.56 inches with the stock rims. Okay, so he's running stock rims, which I believe are 30 millimeters wide or 20, are they, sorry, 27 millimeters wide, I think, on your model there. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is, there is a bit of room to run a little bit bigger than the stock tires. You can run 27.5 plus wheels on this as well. So if you were gonna run the plus setup, the 27.5 plus wheels, you fit 2.8 inches in the back and there is clearance in the fork for 2.8 inches. But Trek recommends putting a slightly longer travel fork to lift the whole bike off the ground. Because with the 27.5 plus wheels, the whole bike gets a little bit lower to the ground, start running into issues with pedal clearance. So this bike has 130 mil travel fork, but you can fit a 140 mil travel fork. It is rated to take a 140 mil travel fork. So 130, 140. The stock bike, the stock 29er, comes with 130 front and rear, but you can run 10 millimeters longer on the front if you so desire. Timothy, is this your full-time job? Because this seems like a dream job. <laughs> it is currently my full-time job, yes. And, uh, and I love talking about bikes, so it doesn't get much better, to be perfectly honest. Speaking of bikes, we have one here. Um, so let's talk about, um, perhaps we'll talk about the geometry, because um, someone was just asking, saying it looks really slack in the video. Um, it's actually not hugely slack by today's modern standards. Let me get my cheat sheet out. Um, there are two geometry positions on this bike. There is a chip up the top here. It's called the minnow link. And the minnow link is an offset link and you flip that around 180 degrees with a five millimeter hex key. That chip comes out, you can flip it around 180 degrees. 
and it shifts the location of the rocker link. It basically kind of lifts the bike up and steepens the angles, or in the low position, it drops it back and it relaxes the head and seat angle and drops the bit bottom bracket. So I'm gonna give you the geometry in the high position because that's what I've been running. To be honest, I don't have a huge need to run it in the low position, I'll tell you why. Um, the head angle is 67.7 degrees, so steeper than probably what it looks on camera there. 67.7, this is in the high position, remember. 67.7 and 74.7 degree seat angle. This is the 18.5, so it's smack bang in the middle of the size range. I call that a medium. Some brands would call it a melage because it is on the bigger side for a medium. Trek also does a 17.5, which is sort of a more traditional medium, but the 18.5, a little bit longer. This has a reach of 450 millimeters, 450 reaches on this 18.5 bike. So a good length, like a nice long front center on this bike. Um, so those are some of the key measurements. We've got 432 millimeter chainstay, so quite short um, for a big kind of 29 or 130 mil trail bike like this, 432 chainstays. So, um, so those are the basic numbers. Now, as I said before, that's in the high geometry position. You get that minnow link, undo that chip, flip it around. You have to do it on both sides, so not just one side, but both sides. There are two chips there. Um, you flip that into the low position, and the geometry relaxes, everything drops down and kicks back. The head angle will get as slack as 67 degrees, and the seat angle will slacken out to 74 degrees. Crucially though, this is the really important part on the geometry of this bike. When you do flip that geometry chip, the bottom bracket lowers by 10 millimeters, which is a, quite a considerable change in the, uh, the bottom bracket height. So there are a couple of things for adjustability here. So it's talking about the option to run slightly longer fork. You've got the option to run 27.5 plus wheels on this bike as well, along with that minnow link flip chip um, for adjusting geometry. You've got a really kind of broad spectrum, um, of a, a broad range of options how you can set this bike up. So, you know, in the kind of more traditional cross country trail bike mode, like I'm running here with the high position on the minnow link, which to be honest, I found to be absolutely adequate for the descending I've been doing, um, and gives you a bit more bottom bracket clearance. Um, the bottom bracket sits, the drop is something like 30 millimeters. So that's 30 millimeters below the hub axle line. So it's still reasonably low. Um, and when I'm sitting on the bike, I actually got someone, to, uh, a good friend of mine, Brent McKenzie, helped me yesterday to measure the sagged bottom bracket height. And it's still over 30 centimeters or 303 millimeters is what we measured. And that's from the axle to the ground. And that's with me sitting on the bike with the suspension at sag. So it's still fairly high, but you can expect that measurement to drop 10 millimeters if you run the minnow link in the low position. But if you were some kind of enduro shredder, and I think this bike is enduro worthy, it is an absolute monster on the descents. The suspension is amazingly active, amazingly plush. You could fit a 140mm fork on here, maybe a Fox 36, maybe a RockShox Lyric if you wanted to go. Uh, I think they go to 140. If not, you could run a Pike. Um, but yeah, Fox 36 I think would be pretty mean on here. With a 140mm fork, drop that minnow link into the low position, you'd really kick the bike back, but you'd still keep it fairly low to the ground as well. So yeah, so you've got a lot of adjustability. That's kind of what I was getting at there. You've got a load of adjustability depending on how you want to set up the bike for your riding style. Now, uh, all right, we've got a few questions that have come through here. Um, Mr. GW says the head angle needs to be slacker and the seat needs to be steeper. Possible, if possible, ang angle set would probably sort it. I 100% disagree with you, Mr. GW. I actually think the geometry on this bike is absolutely on point. Um, now, I was riding yesterday on a local test loop that I've been riding all those other trail bikes on, and I've been testing this in the high position. So remember, that's the steeper head angle. That's a 67.7 degree head angle, which on paper does sound unfashionably steep. A lot of uh, these kind of trail bikes are going to 67, 66.5. The Giant Trance 29, for example, is 66.5 degree head angle. The GT Sensor is a 65.5 degree head angle, and it's basically the same 130mm Travel 29er spec as this. So it's fairly steep in the head angle. It does not feel like that on the trail. It feels super stable, super confident. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with that reasonable reach measurement that we've got here on the medium, 450 
So the front center of the bike is relatively long. It's really planted. And you combine that with this rear suspension design. I'm gonna talk about this in more detail, but this rear shock and the suspension linkage and the way this works, um, very, very impressive. Um, and I think that aids a lot in the descending confidence um, and competence of this bike. Uh, right, uh, missing link, what are the price ranges on these? That's a really good question. I think there's something like 18 model variations of the Fuel EX platform. So they start at the Fuel EX 5 and they go all the way up to the Fuel EX 9.9 .9, and you can get the carbon model um, on Trek Project One uh, custom bike builder. So you can get a custom paint job, you can pick the fork, you can pick the wheels, you can pick the group set, you can, you can pick everything on the bike. You can even have your name painted on the frame if you want to do that. Um, so for the Project One bikes, I think the sky's the limit basically as far as the price is concerned. But let's talk about the price on this. This is the EX8. It's kind of in the middle of the range to the lower end of the range. Um, it's with the aluminium frame and there are for EX5, 7, 8 and 9. So it's one step down from the top end alloy spec. In Australia, this sells for $4,199. In the UK, it retails for £2,700. That is for the Fuel EX829. Um, I don't have American pricing on me, so if anyone in America is tuning in, or Europe as well, I don't have Euros, but that'll give you a rough idea anyway. £2,700, $4,199. Thank you for the question, by the way. Uh, right, Timothy saying, on my enduro bike, I didn't have much money left, so I put a GX11 speed. Would you recommend the E13 12 speed conversion or change to a GX Eagle? That is a great question, Timothy, and I'm glad you brought that up because I am going to... I've just had a review su submitted from one of my testers who has just finished testing the E13 12-speed conversion kit, so it's exactly what you're looking at. And that's basically where it takes an 11-speed SRAM shifter and derailleur, well, basically a 1x11 drivetrain, and converts it to 12-speed. So, um, so make sure you look out on singletrackworld.com because we'll have that review going live hopefully in the next week or so. Um, but yes, I'm not entirely sure how David went with that. Um, as I said, the review has just been sent to me, but a great idea because a lot of people out there with 11 speed drivetrains who maybe want to get that extra range of 12 speed, um, but maybe don't want to buy the entire group set, a whole GX Eagle group set, for example. So uh, stay tuned on that one. All right, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Missing Link says, I peaked on Trek's site. US pricing for the EX5 is $19.99. Not bad. There you go. So that's where the entry point for the EX range starts with the Fuel EX5. They use the same geometry and suspension design throughout the range. It's kind of more expensive components as you go up in price. Um, but the suspension design is, is basically the same through the platform, and that's from the base level EX5 all the way up to the 9.9 .9 and the Project One bikes. So it's a f essentially a single pivot suspension design. T uh, Timothy's saying, okay, thanks, we'll look out. No worries, check out that uh, review once it goes live. So it is, um, it's sort of a single pivot slash four bar arrangement. So essentially we've got one link down the bottom here with your main pivot. We've got the seat stay linkage here, a rocker link, and the rear shock actually floats between the rocker link and an extension of the chainstay. So not unlike the Merida that we checked out two weeks ago, which is one of the test bikes that I'm riding at the moment, the rear shock doesn't attach to the main frame. It sits in between the linkage itself. And so that lower pivot, it actually rotates away as you go through the travel. And the idea is to float the shock in between the, uh, the linkage there, give it a really kind of very, very gentle ramp up towards the end of the travel. So. A lot of people, I've read a lot of reviews on this uh, EX Remedy platform. A lot of people say, it feels like it has more travel than the number says on paper. Um, but it is kind of true with this bike. Um, in fact, it's, it's, I would say it's true with the Merida 120 as well. That floating design, it does kind of eke out. It feels like it ekes out a little bit more travel. Um, certainly on this bike, it's, uh, it's 130 on the back, but it feels a whole lot more capable than that, that's for sure. Um, all right, Timothy, will you be in Europe at one point? Oh, I'm hoping to get over this year. So uh, winter here, but summer in uh, the southern, uh, northern hemisphere, I'm hoping to get over. So yeah, hang tight on that one. Uh, Trail Talk MTB, why has Trek moved away for it for the Slash? Good question. Several reasons for that. 
Um, the main reason is stiffness. Um, so with the full floater linkage, I think with what Trek wanted to do with the slash was to shorten that um, chainstay, um, that those chainstay tubes, beefen up the main pivot area, shorten them a little bit as well. So give them the flexibility to run shorter stays. Um, but basically in the name of stiffness, also with a lot of these modern air shocks, they are uh, much higher volume as well compared to air shocks from even two, three years ago. So we've got on this the Fox Float Evol air can. Um, RockShox do the Debon air can as well. And in terms of the leverage rate of these new school air shocks, they're getting a lot more like a coil. They're getting more linear. And what, that's, what that means is they're not ramping up so hard like air shocks, smaller volume air shocks used to in the past. So what Trek has found is with the modern air shocks, it's reduced the need for that full floater design. So they were able to get the suspension characteristics they wanted on the slash. Um, and also the new Remedy is the same. The Remedy does not have the floating linkage, the full floater linkage. The Remedy and the slash mount the rear shock to the bottom of the uh, bottom bracket, to the top of the bottom bracket, I should say, to the mainframe. Um, because they're finding that the leverage ratio they wanted, the kinematics they wanted, they could be achieved without that full floater design. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, given that, I would suggest that in the future, we may see the Fuel EX going to a similar design, perhaps. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Greg is saying, do you like the dropper post? I've never had a problem. Some people have complained about it. Um, another great question, Greg. Um, I have mixed experience with this Bontrager dropper post here. Now, in Australia, I've had no problems. Genuinely, it works fine. It's okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, very similar to the Giant Dropper Post, to the Brand X, to the Trans X, um, the Syncross Dropper Post. They all kind of fairly similar, really. Um, the, uh, the lever's quite nice, though. I quite like the, the thumb lever for this Dropper Post. In the UK, however, my experience has been less than positive. I found in cold weather conditions, this dropper tends to get really grindy and slow to return as well. And I think it's to do with temperature because it's only ever happened when I've been riding in winter conditions in the UK where the, the post is kind of slow to both compress and return. Sometimes it can get really grindy as well. So it feels like mud and water have gotten through the seals and things are kind of a bit sticky and tight. Exactly the same experience with that giant contact switch dropper post. Um, in cold weather conditions, I found that it gets a bit grindy and, and slow to return, and every now and then it actually needs yanking up, which is a real pain in the bum. Um, but in summer conditions here in Australia, in warmer conditions, no problems at all. So that's my experience, um, and that's similar to uh, other testers in the UK um, at single track. So, um, so some of the complaints may be more to do from those who are riding in wet and cold conditions. Uh, right, Mr. GW, talking about E13 cassettes, why other makers don't make 9.2 smallest cog on the cassettes, both Shimano and SRAM settled on 10 tooth. I suspect it's a tricky thing to do. Um, and I know Shimano is very, uh, very efficiency based in the way that they design drivetrains, so that might have something to do with that one there. We've got a lot of questions coming through here. I don't think I'm going to be able to answer all of them. Um, but Chris is saying, hey, we're loving the reviews and the fact they're on local trail conditions, Victorian rider. Welcome to the show, Chris, and thanks for, thanks for watching. Um, and thanks for your question. Tell me what, what are comparable bikes to this Trek Steed? I'm in the market and leaning towards the acid trance. All right, so if you missed the start of this video, I was just talking about the Fuel EX 130mm Travel 29er. And the reason I'm riding this, it's not a test bike. I'm not reviewing it. It's actually a demo bike from a local Trek dealer. And I just wanted to ride it to give me a bit of a comparison with some of the other test bikes that I've been riding lately, uh, which I'm reviewing. So we've had the Canyon Neuron CF, the Giant Trance 29, the Merida 120, and I've got a couple more bikes coming in the very near future, which you'll you'll see on one of these live video chats as well. Um, so yeah, we, we've been talking a little bit about some of the features on this bike, the geometry, um, and how it rides on the trail as well, which gives me a nice segue to go back into the suspension design, which we were talking about before. Um, the rear shock on this is quite clever. This is a custom shock. So it's a Fox Float DPS shock, which is what you'll find on a lot of trail bikes. Um, we've got a three position lever here. There's a little blue dial here. And we've got 
open, medium, and firm settings, so that's pretty standard. But inside is where the magic happens. It's called the reactive damper. Now this is a patented damper. The Trek has co-developed with Penske Racing Shocks. They brought it out, I think it was 2014 now, and I did, I was very lucky to go on the original launch for that suspension design, the Fuel EX, when they brought out that bright green EX 9.8, if anyone can remember that. Um, had the reactive shock and they did a 29 and a 27.5 model. And uh, so we got to tour the Penske facility and actually look at some of the development and how they created this custom damper um, to test on this rear shock and work out how it was going to feel on the trail. Um, Greg is asking, do, do you feel the DPS rides a bit low in its travel? Um, no, I don't find that at all. Let's talk about that shortly though, about setup and uh, getting the most out of the suspension design. So with the reactive damper, what's really clever about it is it's, uh, it provides regressive damping via um, a particular shim, which is kind of pre-curved. And the idea with this reactive damper is, do you know if you're familiar with the inertia valve that sh uh, Specialized uses on the brain shock? The idea is to keep the suspension basically locked out or fairly close to locked out. And, when you, and that means that when you're pedaling, Suspension stays nice and firm, so you don't get that kind of bobbing sensation. It just stays nice and nice and rigid. Um, but when you encounter a bump, the idea is that the valve, um, the inertia valve, should pop open, allow oil to move through the damper, and then you get suspension. You get nice, squishy, um, active suspension. So the bumps are erased, but you still get the efficiency. Now, in use, the inertia valve, in my experience, tends to be still be a little bit clunky. Even the new Brain 2.0 on that new Epic Fantastic, but you can still feel the valve working on and off. The reactive damper in this shock is much more subtle. It aims to do a similar thing. So the idea is to give you really efficient pedaling, but at the same time, when you hit that bump, the way the valve cracks open and allows oil flow through the shock to give you smooth, uh, active suspension to turn the shock back on, basically. The sensation of that is much more subtle on this shock. To be fair, the lockout isn't as firm, so it doesn't give you that super rock solid platform. And if you're out of the saddle, even in the firm position, if you're kind of out of the saddle really moving around, you will still get some bob from the suspension. But if you're in the saddle and you stay seated, it's, it's firm. You know, it feels fairly close to a lockout. The way that that valve cracks open as soon as you hit a bump, it allows oil flow very, very rapidly, and it allows a lot of oil to move through the shock. And that means that you get active suspension quite quickly with this. In fact, this is one of the few suspension designs, the, one of the few shocks that I've ridden personally, that I can actually ride proper off-road sections of trail in the firm position on the shock. So if you're worried about efficiency, if you're the sort of rider that really wants a kind of really responsive suspension feel, this shock does kind of give you that in that firm position, but it does have a quick breakaway quick enough breakaway that you, if you leave, accidentally leave it locked out, you can ride down downhill and it will still open up and it will remain open as well for those kind of rough, uh, rough, rough rock gardens is what I'm trying to say. So, um, so it works really, really well. To be honest, I've sort of spent most of my time in the middle trail position. So you get a little bit more firm compression damping, you get a little bit more response through the bike, through the handlebar, through the pedals, um, under pedaling, it's, it's still quite efficient. For technical climbing, that middle trail position is fantastic because it holds the bike up a little bit more in its travel, gives you a bit more pedal clearance, so you're less likely to kind of clip and smash your pedals into rocks on the trail. Um, but at the same time, even in the trail position, in the middle trail position, the suspension is still reactive enough, huh? Reactive, um, to open up on uh, kind of ledgier rocks. So you still get that kind of breakaway where the suspension then activates, opens up, and absorbs the impact and absorbs the hit. So, um, quite impressed with how that rear shock works. Now Greg was just saying before, have I found that the shock sags into its travel too much? That's a really good question and it does depend how you set up this bike. Now Trek recommends setting up the sag on this at 28%. They have a fantastic calculator on the website. So if you go to, if you just search Trek suspension setup calculator, if you own a Trek full suspension bike or a hardtail, um, you can basically tell it which year model your bike was, which model you're on, Put in your weight, and that is both you and your riding kit. So your shoes, your helmet, your backpack, whatever you ride in, jump on the scales, get that measurement in pounds or kilos, put that into the calculator, and it'll spit out pressures for the fork, pressures for the shock, 
rebound settings and depending on the model it might give you compression settings for the fork and shock as well. It is a fantastic resource and I found it tends to be pretty accurate as well. Unless you're after a very specific ride quality, it's a really good place to start off with. A really good baseline setting for suspension settings. So I was talking about the rear shock. Trek recommends that about 28%. The fork is interesting. I'm going to talk about this Fox 34 because they recommend only about 15% sag, which is quite low. I'm just, uh, we've had a couple of more questions come through. Uh, Shed Life Guy is saying, I've just swapped out the E13 cassette. The problem is the lack of chain that can make contact with a 9-tooth sprocket. So we're talking about the E13 cassette here, sorry for the segue, um, the E13 cassette which has a 9-tooth small sprocket. Um, you'll be lucky to get six months out of it before a rebuild. Yeah, I think durability on those cassettes is probably the main downside. So um, you do get a lot of range out of them. Um, I think 9 to 46 is the biggest they do. Huge range, um, but yes, potentially durability. Um, Greg is saying, I ride it on open, so that's probably why mine sags, lol. So we're talking about the suspension setting on this Fuel EX and toggling between the open and the trail position. Now the open position I found is generally, better. if it's really rough section of straight trail, then maybe you want to run that. But to be honest, I was only ever running open on, re on the descents. Like if I knew it was going to be a long descent where it's going to be quite rocky and rough, that's when you that's when I flick into the open position and you get maximum <laughs> maximum performance in this bike is really fast. I'm just going to jump straight ahead here this bike is super fast on the descents I actually can't believe how quick it is I think combination of those high volume 29 inch wheels and tires um, the 130 mil of travel is very very supple it's incredibly active part of that surely is the ABP suspension design. So Trek actually puts a pivot around the rear axle and that's called the ABP pivot. So you've got the axle, that's my elbows, you've got the seat stay and the chain stay, and there's actually a pivot there where the seat stay, where the brake is mounted to, rotates around the rear axle. Now there's a whole bunch of techno mumbo jumbo there, but basically the idea is to isolate braking from the suspension. So it means that when you're on the rear brake, the rear suspension is still able to move, it's still able to compress. So rather than the suspension kind of stiffening up when you're on the brakes, which you do a lot of when you're descending, right? Rather than the suspension stiffening up and potentially losing traction, because if the suspension is stiff on the descent, the rear wheel's more likely to buck around and kind of pop off rocks and roots. And when the wheel's in the air, when the tire's in the air, there's no traction. So the idea with this ABP is to allow the rear tire to maintain contact with the ground, to maintain traction. Um, and in my experience, having tested Trex and Gary Fishers back in the day, um, over the last kind of 10 years or so, it does work really, really well. Um, so you combine that ABP pivot, the full floater design, that Fox Float DPX, DPS shock with the reactive damper in it, no less. Um, and this 130mm travel bike is one of the few 130mm travel 29ers that I would totally, happily turn up to an enduro race on. It's quite incredible the quality of suspension that's on offer here and uh, one of my local descents that I was doing yesterday is horribly rocky off camber it's got lots of shaly pointy out sticky rocks um, the sort of thing that kind of really messes with your confidence because you don't want to puncture a tire um, but at the same time there's lots of stuff to kind of slip around there's loose rocks in there and this thing just plows I, I honestly let off the brakes point the handlebar point and shoot and it just goes it's one of the most descending hungry 29er trail bikes that I've personally ridden. Um, and that sort of goes back to the or original question that someone was asking before about the 67.7 degree head angle going, that sounds steep, it should be slacker than that. I don't actually think it should be that much slacker. It's, it, you can make it slacker in the low position. You can kick that head angle out to 67 degrees. Um, so it'll drop nearly a full degree on the head angle. But even in the high position that I'm running it here in 67.7, it, it's plenty confident on the descents, no issues there whatsoever. Uh, right, we had a few more questions come through. Do, 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 leave and the EX 9.8 as well. This is the standard float reactive shock, so it doesn't have the through shaft design. I've not ridden the through shaft shock yet. Um, I would really love to, but I've not had any Trek test bikes turn up. Just to reiterate, this isn't a test bike, this is a demo bike from a local shop, which I'm just riding for shits and giggles and to compare with a couple of other trail bikes that I've been riding lately. So, um, so yeah, so, so far it's, it's, been, it's been quite eye-opening to be perfectly honest because 
This bike has been around for about three years now, I think. I think 2019 signals three years that the Fuel EX has been in this current configuration. So the aluminium frame, the geometry hasn't changed in three years. They have added new shock technology, new fork, new components and so on. Um, but the actual frame itself and the geometry is unchanged for the past three years. So I sort of thought, you know, maybe this bike's going to feel a bit outdated compared to some of the newer bikes I've been riding, but that's not the case. This feels as is just as good, if not better, than some of those other bikes um, in certain situations. Um, Troy is asking, is this bike built with frame material Trek believes will be the most important change in cycling in 30 years? No, it's not. Um, I did see that commercial that Trek has coming out. I have an idea of what it might be, but I guess we'll find out um, I think in later this month, isn't it? Sometime in March 21st or something like that. Anyway, Trek's kind of teasing some new secret material. Um, but remember that Trek... No, I'm not going to give away a clue. <laughs> um, but no, that material you're talking about, it's not in this frame. This is just an aluminium bike. Actually, on that note, I should add, this is nearly 14 kilos out of the box. This is quite heavy. So it's, uh, I mean, a lot of that's in the aluminium frame, a lot of that's in these wheels as well, and the tires, they're not the lightest tire, tires, and they're not the lightest wheels, um, there's quite a lot of rotational mass in there, and you do feel that on the climbs, and uh, Greg, who's the owner of the last uh, year's version of this, who's commenting and question, asking questions in the uh, comment section there, he was talking about riding in the open position, I personally recommend climbing in either the medium or the firm positions on that rear shock, it makes a huge difference, and because of the reactive damper, it's, it's quite quick to open up if you do encounter bumps on the trail. Um, so if it's not a really rough technical climb, run it in the firm position all the way. Um, if it's a technical climb, put it in the medium trail position. Um, I wouldn't climb with it in the open position, to be perfectly honest, because the bike does tend to sink into the travel. It doesn't pedal as well as some of the other trail bikes I've been riding lately. Should, should, we should probably talk about that. There does feel to me, I haven't seen any graphs, and to be honest, I'm not really interested in graphs. I'm more interested in how a bike actually feels on the trail. Um, but to me, it feels like there's less anti-squat in this suspension design, particularly compared to that Merida 120 trail bike, which is quite zippy and poppy in its, in its pedaling, but also in its performance on the trail. This feels a bit more grounded, a bit more steady. And in terms of pedaling, you can definitely get bob out of the suspension design if you're running it in the open position. In the trail position, it firms everything up and it feels a lot more efficient to me. And, uh, but because of that reactive damper, I mean, it, it still works really, really well when it gets rough. Greg, um, could you do a drop off in the middle position just fine? Yes, absolutely. You can do a drop off in the firm locked out position. You, it's, 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 you can actually descend on this bike with the firm position on the shock. That's possible, that's absolutely possible. So uh, the way that it breaks away and opens the shock and allows for suspension activity, um, you can definitely run it in. Yeah, yeah, you're saying I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely, you can do that. And that's, has anyone out there, now I'm admitting something here, have you ever done a climb with the lockout, the suspension locked out, the fork and the shock or one or the other, and then you've actually ridden a descent with the suspension locked out and kind of halfway down you're thinking, wow, this kind of, this is really rocky, this descent. This is really bouncy. Has anyone, has anyone ever done that? I've done that. I've done that plenty of times. I've just forgotten to flick the shock back into the open position. Um, it happens, you know, in the heat of the moment, particularly when you get to the top of the climb and you're absolutely exhausted and you just want to get the downhill, you just want to get onto the downhill and get it done. Um, it does happen. But the beauty about this reactive shock is if you do leave it in the locked out position, it's not a crazy firm lockout, but the way that it breaks through and opens up the shock, um, it means you can ride it in that locked out position. Now, I just wanna say hello to everyone who's tuning in now, because we've got a load of people who are watching live. Um, if you're enjoying this video, please give me a, a thumbs up and let me know where you're watching, uh, whereabouts in the world you're watching from. And if you've got any questions, this is a live video, so you can drop them into the comment section right here and, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Uh, but yeah, give me a thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. And uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Mike Alexander's asking a question here. How do you feel this bike compares to the new Specialized Stump Jumper ST? That is a really good question, Mike. Um, the Specialized Stump Jumper ST uh, comes in 27.5 and 29 inch versions. The 29 is obviously more comparable to this Fuel X29. It has a touch less travel, 120 mil travel, whereas this is 130 front and rear. Um, I think the Stump Jumper ST, the, suspension, the FSR suspension design is also very plush, very active. 
So not dissimilar to this full floater linkage that Trek is rolling with on the Fuel EX, the Stump Jumper also has really good activity under braking. When you're riding really rough, choppy terrain, it keeps the tyre connected to the ground. It's great. Um, the complaint with FSR sometimes is that it doesn't pedal so well, um, and that's because it is an active suspension design. So just like this guy here, you'll be wanting to toggle the rear shock a little bit um, to get a little bit more climbing performance um, if you want to get a bit more efficiency out of that suspension design. I think the Stump Jumper ST is also a super capable bike. Um, this just feels a little bit more of a monster. Um, and I think part of that is to do with the fact that it is got a, that it does have a little bit more reach. This is a 450mm reach on the medium 18.5. Um, so a reasonably long front center. And uh, with that suspension design and those big tires as well, it does feel really grounded, really plush, really, uh, really stable. You feel in the bike on the descents. The Stump Jumper ST is slightly nippier um, in my experience, but it has been a while since I've ridden that Stump Jumper ST. I'd love to get my hands on one of those, uh, one of the current models to actually review and test against this and all the other trail bikes I'm riding at the moment. So, but from, from my limited experience on that ST, that's how I would summarize it compared to this Fuel EX. Um, right, Good Soul is saying, does it have a threaded BB? This is a press fit bottom bracket, it's a PF92. Oh, he said, uh, or creek fit, yeah. <laughs> um, to be honest, I've had no issues with the bottom bracket. Um, on this, this is a demo bike that's had a lot of riding, by the way. The bottom bracket's absolutely fine. I think press fit bottom brackets get a really bad rap because a lot of early press fits were pretty shit, and they did creak a lot, and tolerances were really low. Um, and it meant that the cups could actually shift in the frame and that's where you get creaking and cracking noises and they were horrible. Tolerances over the last couple of years have gone right up. So generally we're finding that there's less noise in the first place, they're wearing a lot better. Um, and uh, in a lot of cases they do make sense. Harder to work on though, because you, you can't just unthread it with your regular Holotech tool. You do need a kind of slide hammer to you know, knock the, um, the cups out. So perhaps a little less easy to work on for home mechanics. Um, Mark Smith is asking, later on, what's the story with the Trek frame on the wall and the Fisher jersey? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to give you the full story on that, but these don't belong to me. These belong to my friend Ben, who owns this workshop. There's a lot of glory in here, including a Klein mantra. So um, I've been threatening to do a video of this workshop for a little while now. I think we need to make it happen. So I'll line up some time with Ben. We could do a bit of a tour of all the retro paraphernalia in here, because there's a lot of good stuff. Um, right, there's so many questions coming through. Um, thanks for everyone who's tuning in. Give us a like, if, uh, thumbs up if you're enjoying this video. Toon is saying, hi, what can you tell me about the brake? Shimano MB6000 on the EX8 next Sunday will be my first ride on my new bike. Right, these are Shimano Dior brakes. Um, they're really good. Don't know if I need to say much more than that. They're Shimano's. Um, they feel like SLX, they feel like XT brakes. They're solid, they have really good bike point. Um, they don't have tool-free adjustment reach, so you need a 3mm Allen, 2.5mm Allen key to adjust the reach on these levers. So make sure you have that tool with you if you're going for a ride and you want to adjust the lever inch, particularly on those first couple of rides where you get that sort of thing dialed in. Um, so that's one thing that they do miss out on. But great power, we've got 180mm rotor on the front, 180mm rotor on the back, which is good times. Um, if you wanted more power, you could potentially put a 200 on the front. Um, if you really wanted, but I think the 180 mix front and rear with these Shimano Dior brakes is really good. Um, no issues there whatsoever. Giblet is saying, hi there, just wondering what the head angle is you might have already said that in. I've just tuned in. Well, firstly, thanks for tuning in and welcome to Fresh Goods Friday Live or Fresh Goods Thursday Evening Live. Um, head angle on, on this, there are two head angles because there are two geometry positions with the minnow length. So the head angle in the high position, which I've got it here, is 67.7 degrees. And if you kick it into the low position, that kicks back to 67 degrees. It also drops the bottom bracket height by 10 millimeters. Now I've been riding in the high position for, uh, for, the, for the couple of rides that I've had on this bike. And I don't feel it needs to be much slacker. To be honest, I actually like the extra ground clearance as well that you get. When you go into that low position and the head angle kicks to 67, 10 millimeter lower bottom bracket height means the pedals do get quite close to the ground. That's quite a lot, 10 millimeters that the pedals get close to the ground. So bear that in mind. Although a lot of journalists like me kind of go, oh, if there's a geometry adjuster, we just put it in the slack position and leave it there. Um, I had messed around with the geometry chip on this on a previous EX9 test bike. 
And to be honest, that high position, in my experience, for my riding style and my trails, works beautifully. I, after messing around with a low position, which kind of really kicks things back and it feels a bit chopper-esque, um, I prefer it in that high position. But anyway, it's there for you to mess around with. And like I said, you can put a longer fork on this bike as well. So if you really want to enduro it up, put a 140mm fork on it, put that geometry chip in the low position, um, and that thing will be pretty rad, that's for sure. Um, I just want to talk about the Fox Float 34 fork on here. Oh, Wilfred's saying, hey, I've got the 2017 model. Right on, man. Well, I think the 2017, 2018, yeah, 2017, it's still the same frame shape, same geometry. So this isn't a brand new bike. And as I said, the reason I wanted to test this was to see just how, whether it feels dated or not, because technically we've got bikes coming out at the moment, the Trans 29er, we've got the Canyon Neuron, we've got the GT Sensor, uh, we've got all sorts of trail bikes in this 29er short travel trail bike coming out. So whether the Fuel EX feels a bit dated or not, um, I can wholeheartedly confirm that is not the case. Uh, good soul, does that brake lever adjustment affect the pads and the caliper or are they independent things? They're completely independent. Where you run the brake lever reach when you adjust that little bolt up there doesn't affect the pads on the rotor. So once you get your caliper set up on the rotor, you shouldn't really have to touch that too much. Um, the brake lever reach is independent, so don't worry about that there. Um, right, so I was gonna say about the Fox 34 float fork, this has got the grip damper in it. This is called the rhythm fork. It's designed as Fox's cheap option. So the higher end Fox forks come with the fit four damper, which is the sealed fit damper. This is an open bath or a semi-open bath damper called the grip damper. Rebound adjustment down the bottom, we've got compression adjustment up the top. The spring assembly, the Evol spring assembly is the same. So whether you get the gold factory Kashima model or this entry level 34 rhythm, the spring assembly is the same. That's the Evol air spring and Evol stands for expanded volume. So it's a high volume design with high volume negative chamber and it gives you a really plush feel. The sensitivity on this fork is really good. Now I noticed yesterday when I was getting a little bit too rad, rad for me, probably not rad for you, but rad for me, um, on certain sections of trail, I did actually bottom out this fork once or twice. Now I cracked it open, um, not, <laughs> no, I didn't break it. I mean, when I got back to the workshop, let me stipulate, I opened up the top cap to have a look inside to see how many volume spaces were inside. Out of the box, this only has one volume space, and one of those green Fox volume spaces. Now that's important to note because the Giant Trance 29 that I'm also testing at the moment comes with three. So this only has one, and the Giant has three. They're the same fork. They're the same 130mm travel 29 inch fork, grip damper, Evol air spring, Fox float, 34 rhythm, exactly the same. But the way the fork feels is completely different because the Giant um, has a much smaller volume and this has a much higher volume. So that's something to bear in mind. If you own one of these bikes or you're looking at buying one, um, bear in mind that you may need to add volume spaces into the air spring to get it to ramp up more because yesterday I actually crunched full travel a couple of times. It wasn't dramatic, but definitely the O-ring was all the way up the top of the crown. And to be honest, that doesn't happen to me too often. I always like to have a bit of travel in reserve on the fork for really like panic, you know, shit your pants moments. Um, but this one I was able to kiss full travel a couple of times. So if this were my bike, I'd be putting a second volume spacer inside this air spring. Um, so that's something worth bearing in mind, particularly if you're a heavier rider, if you're sort of 90, 100 kilos plus, you're gonna be wanting to put more volume spaces in here to give you more ramp up. And I will say the same thing for the rear shock. Now I didn't bottom out this rear shock. I used full travel multiple times, but there was never any moment where this travel crunched, where I felt the shock kind of hit and make contact. That never happened. But I used full travel plenty of times, which is, to me is a sign of a really well-tuned suspension design. Bear in mind, I'm about 70 kilos with riding gear though. I'm fairly light um, on the lighter side of the spectrum. So heavier riders who are looking for a bit more progression, a bit more ramp up, you will want to consider adding a volume spacer, a plastic volume space in the rear shock to give it that bottom out support, particularly when you're hitting drop offs and jumps, you want that kind of ramp up so you're not crunching through the travel. So for me, the setup has been really good on this bike. As I said, I probably want to add a token or maybe even half a token into the fork air chamber. The rear shock feels beautiful, but if you are a heavier, more aggressive rider, you may want to consider, and if it's something you're not familiar with, talk to your local bike shop where you got this bike from or where you're getting it from, 
um, have a yarn to them about um, air volume spaces because it's a really quick and easy thing to do when you know what you're doing and it makes a big difference on the trail. And the reason I mention that is um, uh, one of my industry peers, Tom Marvin, who works for Bike Radar, he reviewed this bike last year and he was very glowing in his review, but one of the things he mentioned was about running through the suspension travel. Tom is a bigger bloke than I am, and I think um, in terms of that volume that this, um, the air fork and the air shock have out of the box, it is quite high volume. So if you're a bigger rider, a more aggressive rider, you're probably gonna meet full travel more quickly, and uh, you wanna consider putting volume spaces inside the fork, potentially in the rear shock, just to give it a bit more support. For me though, it was absolutely dialed, it was fantastic. Uh, right, we've got a few more questions coming through here. Good Soul saying, how comes the rear shock fashion is going back to coil springs, yet forks seemingly aren't? Is it just a matter of time? Great question. Coil springs are really hot right now. Um, we've got brands like Cane Creek and MRP. Um, Formula as well have just released um, a prototype of a coil sprung fork. We've got um, brands like, well, Fox Rock Shocks, Cane Creek, MRP as well. Um, doing coil sprung rear shocks as well. Are they coming back? I would say yes. I say we're seeing a bit more pickup from those smaller brands, um, but there are rumors that Rock Shocks is working on a coil sprung lyric fork. Now, if a big brand, now if a big brand, I should say, excuse me, like Fox and Rock Shocks, um, look at putting coil springs back onto trail bikes. Um, once those big brands go to it, then I would say that the the trend is going to have a lot more momentum. So. Um, look, in, look out for that. It's called the Lyric Ultimate. I actually haven't ridden that fork. I haven't seen any information on it. I'm going off Andy's uh, kind of spy shots that we've been seeing online the last couple of weeks. So, uh, right. Do, 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 do. Uh, JC, I went with the 2019 Stump Jumper instead. Wonder if I made the wrong move. And uh, Matt Love is saying, uh, who's answering JC's question, no, you made a good choice with the Stumpy. Better than the Fuel EX anyway. At least that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I don't think you made a mistake. The Stump Jumper is a cracking bike. That's a really, really good bike. I think Specialized hit the nail on the head with that new Stump Jumper, both the long travel and the short travel, and the Evo, which is a bit of a beast. Um, shout out to uh, the news story we had on the website a couple of days ago, the Evo Carbon, uh, Stump Jumper Evo Carbon has just come out. You can read that on singletrackworld.com. And, uh, and I'm also gonna point out, we're gonna give a wave to all the people who are tuning in. We've got loads of people tuning in live. Welcome to the live video. Um, if you're enjoying this, give us a thumbs up. It is a live video, so you can ask me any questions you've got in the comment section below, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. We've been talking about this Fuel EX8 29er test bike, um, or sorry, demo bike, I should say, because I'm not reviewing this, but I did want to test it and give you guys a bit of feedback on how this bike rides, because a lot of people have been asking about how this bike compares to other review bikes that I've been testing, so the Merida 120, the Giant Trance 29, and the Canyon Neuron CF. Now, the, I just want to segue a little bit because there's a really important note that I want to talk about this bike, and I just remembered because I saw it on my cheat sheet here. Trek has a, has a design on this bike called the Knock Block. Now, does anyone know what the Knock Block does? Um, drop, let me know in the comment section below. But you'll notice that the Fuel EX, the Remedy, and the Slash all have this kind of straight down tube. So rather than the fork kind of curving up and then dropping down and curving again, sort of snaking its way down from the head tube to the bottom bracket, this is pretty much a straight down tube. It curves a little bit at the end, but it's, it's mostly straight up here. Now, with modern boost forks, what's happening is the forks are getting wider. So you can see this fork here, if you visualize this, the fork is actually getting wider, um, and that's to accommodate the wider 110 millimeter boost hub spacing on the front, but it's also to get more tire clearance. So these, these forks will now fit a 2.8 inch comfortably, um, and that's crazy because in the past, plus tires um, have required a, spe a special fork, a very specific fork. Now Fox and Rock Shocks are just, just designing all of their standard forks to accommodate plus tires. So, this will accommodate plus tires in here, in this chassis. But it does mean the whole crown is getting further apart. It's getting wider and wider and wider. And what happens when the fork crown gets wider and wider? Well, when you turn the fork, that wider stanchion and the crown is gonna make contact with the top, tube, uh, the top of the down tube, isn't it? So the wider fork, um, these wider modern boost forks, they're, ca they're causing more issues with the fork kind of potentially ramming into the frame. So the solution to this is to have like a curvy kind of frame 
that gives you clearance around the crown on the fork and the down tube so you don't smash the down tube. Now that's all well and good, but Trek decided we don't want to do that. Um, maybe they decided it looks a bit naff, I don't know, um, the kind of curvy tube. They say it's about stiffness. So this, this from the head tube down to the bottom bracket, we've basically got a straight down tube and they call that the straight shot down tube. They say it's all about stiffness. I think it looks great, but the problem with that straight down tube is you end up with clearance issues between the fork crown and the down tube. So if this didn't have this special stem, this crown would go careering into the down tube if you crashed and you'd, you'd probably damage the frame, you'd probably damage the fork, you'd damage yourself as well in the process. It would just generally not be a good time. So what they've done is they've created a special stem and headset and it's called the knock block. And I think a few people have guessed this here. Yeah, so Good Soul said, is it to stop the bar swinging around and causing damage? Yes, absolutely. All the forks, yes, yeah, so Good Soul's onto it too. The knock block system is an integration with a chip in the frame, a headset and the stem, and it's basically a keyed um, stop in the, uh, in the headset and, uh, and the frame. So the idea is that, I'm gonna visualize this, that is the maximum travel that the fork will rotate around. It won't turn any further than that, and it, and it happens on the other side as well. So you can, you can still turn the handlebars, but they're limited as to how far they'll go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so if you're a fan of X-Ups and kind of spinning 360s on the bike, this is not the bike for you. It's impossible to do. Good Soul, I think Canyon have something similar. They certainly do. They call it the IPU, the Impact Protection Unit. However, on the Trek bike that we've got here, it's not just about the shifter and brake lever hitting the top tube, it's about the fork crown hitting the frame. So we've got a big rubber bump stop here and this is a fail safe. In case something fails with the knock block system, you've got this big rubber bumper here to protect the frame from the fork crown. Now the knock block system is very, very clever um, from this regard. However, it is kind of annoying. I experienced that this morning when I went to put this bike in the back of the car. Obviously you can't rotate the handlebar the full direction. So if you're putting the bike into the back of the car with wheels on or wheels off or whatever, it's a bit awkward to do sometimes. So there's a mild annoyance there um, for, for that. Also, this is worth noting. If you wanna run your own handlebar and stem, say if you don't like the current handlebar and stem on this, and to be honest, I'm not a huge fan. 750 millimeter wide bars, the stem is 60 millimeters long. If this were my bike, I'd be looking at putting on 780 bars for sure, and maybe bringing that stem back to 50, maybe even sort of 40, 45. Now Bontrager do sell these knock block stems um, anywhere from 40 millimeters up to 110 millimeters. So there are loads of options from Bontrager to change the stem, and that's a very special knock block stem. However, you can fit a regular stem. You don't have to run Bontrager's knock block stem. Um, so if you've got your own like rental bar and stem, or you've got an MV cockpit, or you've got you know a nice deity stem or a spank handlebar, whatever, and you want to run that on this bike, you prefer to run wider bar, shorter stem, whatever, you can do that. However, there is a special part that you will require. And I raise this point because it's alarmingly expensive. <laughs> It's a special headset spacer, and it's a locking headset spacer. Um, I assume it's just called the knock block headset spacer or something like that. And what it does um, is it keys into the other spacers and into the headset. So um, the idea is to retain that kind of stopping function um, that the knock block provides to stop the bars and the fork from careering into the down tube. That spacer, sells for 62 Australian dollars. I couldn't quite believe that when I found out yesterday. $62, it's literally a headset spacer with a pinch bolt on it, so it clamps, physically clamps onto the steerer tube, and that's, uh, that's what gives you uh, that fixed, kind of indexed um, position. Good soul, lol, typical bike industry. I know, it's, it's bonkers. I think that's a part that should come with every one of these bikes because as much as uh, this is a, the handlebar and stem does the job it's meant to, um, I think it's nice to have the option to run a different brand handlebar and stem rather than be locked into a certain standard. Of course, you're not locked into a certain standard. You can run whatever bar and stem you want on here. But if you're looking at buying one of these bikes or you already own one and you're thinking you want to put on a different bar and stem, add on 62 Australian dollars, which I assume is probably around 30 to 35 pounds for a little locking headset spacer. Um, which will allow you to run a different stem 
um, other than the stock Bontrager knock block system. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that's frankly quite ridiculous. <laughs> um, I thought that part was going to be about a quarter of that price, but it's not. That's what it is. Um, but hey, I'm not Trek. It's not my decision to make. Um, but there you go. A little bit of tidbit of information for you there. All right. So uh, we've got loads of people tuning in here. Welcome and thank you for joining me for the live Q&A on this Trek Fuel EX8 demo bike. Um, I've gone, basically gone through all the details I possibly can on this bike. Um, let me just run you through a couple of things that I like and what I don't like about this bike. So what I don't like about this bike, um, I'd like it to have a bit more drop on this dropper post. This is 125mm on the medium. I'm sounding like a broken record here, um, but it would be nice to have a little bit more drop on this bike, particularly because you can get into really steep, hairy situations on this bike that you wouldn't, perhaps wouldn't think you would on a 130mm travel trail bike. So I think a bit more drop would be really nice on there. I just mentioned before about the bar and the stem, 750mm by today's standards, it's too narrow. It's actually narrower than that 760 that came on the Canyon Neuron, and even on that bike I said it's too narrow. Just put 780s or 800s on. Let us cut the bars down, all right? You know, you can make a bar narrow, but you can't make it wider. So just, you know, bite the bullet and put some wide bars on this bike. This thing is an absolute rocket ship downhill. It deserves wider bars than this. So that's something um, I'm not a big fan of um, on this bike. So I would be looking at um, putting on a wider handlebar if it was mine personally. Um, anything else I don't like on this bike? Not really. Aside from that, the spec is dialed. The tires are great. The wheels are nice and wide. They come with tubeless rim strips fitted. All you need to do is add the tubeless valve and some sealant and these wheels are ready to go tubeless. So that's a big double thumbs up. Um, the suspension quality, I think that's the biggest, um, the biggest positive of this bike, that rear suspension, the fork is fantastic as well, very balanced, balanced is a word that I've used um, with other Trek bikes that I've reviewed in the past, and uh, full suspension Treks I should add, um, and that's the case here, the, the front suspension and the rear suspension, they work beautifully well together. The rear suspension in particular, it's super active, that's whether you're on the brakes, whether you're off the brakes, whether you're charging into rock gardens, um, or you're trying to climb up technical sections, you've got good usability out of that compression switch on the rear shock. Gives you a load of versatility for giving that firmer kind of position if you're riding smoother trails. But with the reactive damper and that very fast, rapid breakaway, where you, all of a sudden you go from a firm shock to an open, active shock, um, gives it a load of versatility. You can just leave it in one position and ride and forget about it. Um, Derek is saying the Trek Fuel is a smashing bike, very underrated, super fast and hoppy. Totally agree. I think it's underrated because this is the third year this bike has been in this current configuration. So maybe it's maybe the marketing machine has gone a little bit quiet on this bike. But this this is a cracking trail bike. It's so fast. It's so confident downhill. Um, great suspension. Great tires. Um, yeah, very, very confident, very, very competent. If you, if you want a confidence-inspiring bike, um, but you just want a trail bike, you don't want a full-blown enduro race bike, you don't want a cross-country race bike, put this on your list. This is a, this is a really good bike. Um, good salt. Is it available in any other colors? Oh, we covered that before. So this is the stealth black option, but there is a beautiful cherry red option if you prefer something that doesn't look, um, I don't know, as, as boring as this. Is that harsh? I don't know, black bikes tend to sell really well. So, um, so um, yeah, so Trek provide two color options in a lot of their popular models. So in this EX8, you've got the full black or you've got the cherry red. So there are options there. Um, yeah, so I think I've kind of covered everything there and uh, I think I might probably leave it there and I might go for another ride on this because I really want to ride it again. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed. If you're watching this, give me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video. Video, if you've enjoyed the video. Sorry, I've been speaking a million miles a minute and uh, yeah, I'm a little, uh, I'm getting a little bit tongue tied here, so apologies for that. Uh, Ron is just saying, I, I just bought the 2018 frame set. Nice one. Uh, let us know what you're going to build it up with. I'd love to know. Um, but yes, if you've enjoyed watching this video, give us a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already subscribed to Single Track. Um, I've got a lot of videos I'm working on at the moment. Um, as I said, I have a brand new test bike that just turned up yesterday or yesterday. And um, I'm going to be talking about that bike next week. So we're going to try and do these live videos every Friday morning Australia time. Um, if you're over the other side of the world, that might be Thursday evening or Thursday in the afternoon. Um, so yes, I will be talking about a brand new trail bike that's joining the, uh, the test fray. Um, so we'll be showing you that next week. So stay tuned for that one. 
Um, and I think I've got another test bike turning up after that. So um, if anyone wants to give me a hand with testing, that'd be great because I've got test bikes coming out of my ears at the moment. Um, but yes, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, we'll have plenty more coming your way. So give us a like, give us a subscribe. And, uh, and stay tuned for more. Jump on singletrackworld.com. We've got loads of cool stories that have gone on the website this week. That new stump jumper, Evo Carbon, that looks pretty hot. Um, I reckon it certainly does. Coil shock on the back. We were talking about coil forks and shocks before. Um, that stump jumper, Evo Carbon, check that review out. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, and lots of other cool stuff. We've also just finally published the full review of the Trust message linkage fork. That's that crazy multi-link fork that costs 2,700 US dollars. Um, Dave Weagle's involved, Jason Shears from Ed, who founded uh, Edge Composites, now Envy is involved. Um, David's review is live on the website right now. You really wanna read that review. If you're interested about that fork um, and all of the hype that surrounded it, um, I think you'll be very, I won't give away too much, but I think you'll be very interested to read the review. It's a very honest review um, of David's experience. So uh, jump on the website and have a bit of a look at that. Wow, we've just gone over an hour, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining, everyone. I really appreciate everyone who's watched this live video um, and has also joined in to ask questions and comments. Um, really uh, makes this job really fun for me, and uh, I'm glad to have you all along for the ride. So I'm going to leave it there. I hope wherever in the world you are, you've got lots of riding planned for this weekend, um, hanging out with mates, drinking booze, eating food. Oh, Trail Talk MTV. Oh, he's just, uh, you've gone super chat. That's what you've done. Thanks, man. That's bloody awesome. Good on you. Um, Trail Talk MTV's just donated a um, couple of bucks to the show. So um, that's fantastic, and uh, we, if we can get that rolling, then we can do more of these videos. And, uh, and if you're enjoying them, then we've got plenty more coming your way. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to head off, but um, just want to say a huge thank you to Trail Talk MTV. That is absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate that. Everyone at Single Track, we're pumped on that. That is fantastic. So um, thank you very much. I hope you have a great weekend, in particular Trail Talk MTV. But everyone out there, I hope it's filled with bikes, with riding, with mates, with beers, with uh, great pub food and uh, whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great time. Matt Love says, thank you for this live chat. You definitely sound like a paid spokesperson for Trek. However, this live stream was very informative. No worries, I can guarantee I'm not paid by Trek. Um, if I was, I probably wouldn't be in a shed like this. Um, Trail Talk MTB, all good. See you're working super hard. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I'm glad you enjoyed the video. And Jensen saying, a good soul planning on new bike next year. Oh, there's a conversation going on there between two viewers. All right, I'm going to leave it there, guys. Uh, I'm going to go ride some bikes, and uh, I'll see you next time we do this video. All right.